Episode 5 opens on a pure white screen that slowly crumples into the rapid snowfall of the avalanche. The wind and snow clear just enough to see the train, plummeting down the mountainside only moments after the end of the prior episode. We get snapshots of each character from the bottom of the train going up, catching their initial reactions to the fall. Yang is lowest, having her metal arm dug into the side of one of the carriages and being dragged down the side of it by gravity. Blake is doing her best to keep herself stable by swinging from piece of debris to piece of debris with her ribbon. Weiss and Roman are near the middle of the falling train cars, gripping on for dear life to opposing gangway ladders. Roman is gripping onto Neo, who had opened her umbrella to float and almost became swept away in the disaster. Crow lands on the door to one of the carriages, just as the one above it slams down onto it, forcing it inside. He hurtles through the center of the train before turning into a bird and flying out the other end. At the very top, where the train was severed, is Ruby, who managed to hook herself onto the dome of the train car and is struggling to keep track of everything happening around her. Weiss watches as a manticore comes bursting out of the snow, catching Blake off guard and knocking her off her swing. Quick on her feet, Weiss slides down the side of her compartment and stabs Merton Astor into the roof, summoning a gravity cliff to keep herself in place and one that safely locks Blake down on the same car. Unfortunately, further down, she sees Yang begin to fall, and she has to expend extra effort to summon a third glyph and keep her grounded as well. Weiss is visibly sweating at keeping all three glyphs in place, and it's made even more stressful as a manticore comes flying in to kill her. Before it can reach her, Ruby sees this and shifts Crescent Rose into its rifle mode, willingly letting herself fall as she opens fire on the Grim. It's knocked away, and so is a second one. But as Ruby is falling, a broken beam from the bridge comes sliding in to crash against the carriage she's sliding down. She barely dodges in time, but Crescent Rose is caught between the beam and the carriage and is damaged, locking it in its rifle configuration. The beam continues tumbling, taking it on a crash course with the dazed Blake. Yang looks to Weiss and shouts her name, and Weiss quickly releases Yang so she can spring up and punch the base of the pillar, shattering it into splinters all the way up its spine and saving Blake. Unfortunately, this sends Yang careening off into the avalanche's flurry. Neo, seeing Yang in danger, disengages her umbrella and plummets after her. Roman, still gripping her leg, yells, Neo, Neo, and he is forced to let go. Neo skydives through the chaos after Yang, flipping and running along fragments of the bridge into the snow. Roman, having lost his balance and his grip, falls forward, landing on Weiss's back and breaking her concentration on Blake. She maintains her own glyph, thankfully, and manages to recover in enough time to lock down Roman as well, but Blake barely manages to clear her head in time to sling her ribbon into the debris and reorient herself. Too low to ascend anymore, Blake focuses on slowing her descent with the fallen collateral. Up with Ruby, she's barely balancing on the side of one of the train cars when a manticore charges her. She tries to transform Crescent Rose in order to cut it, but discovers its damaged state and has to dodge in a panic as the manticore swipes at her. It careens past her into the snow, right past a train car that's beginning to drift towards the one that Weiss is standing on with a lot of speed. Without sparing a second thought, Ruby activates her semblance and rushes down the train cars, pushing her speed to its absolute limit and suffusing her legs with aura to try and kick it beyond any speed she's ever reached alone. Her legs strain under the pressure, but it achieves the desired effect. The world around her begins to slow as she rushes down the side of the train cars, dodging Grimm and Debris all the way down to her partner. As the carriage closes in to crush Weiss, Ruby tackles her, pushing her out of the way just in time. With her concentration broken, Weiss's glyph holding Roman breaks as well, sending him into freefall. The two carriages collide in a show of sparks, and time speeds back up. We watch as the caboose lands at the base of the mountain first, followed by the subsequent car hurtling into an icy lake, smashing it open. Yang and Neo follow right after, splashing down into the water. Blake slingshots around one of the cars just before it lands, and manages to land almost perfectly on the ice. Roman, hurtling unassisted, is caught by Crow, and both men tumble into the snow covering all the ice. Last are Ruby and Weiss, who touch down using Ruby's momentum to attempt a horizontal skid. Ruby's form is off, however, and she lands on one foot only. There is a sickening snap as she and Weiss go rolling across the ice, Ruby shielding Weiss as best she can with her own body. Over with Blake, she's breathing heavily, seemingly relieved to be alive, only to hear another crash behind her. We get a wide shot as Ruby, Weiss, Roman, Crow, and Blake all see another train car crash into the lake. Ruby and Weiss watch with horror as the ice begins to crack around them. Crow, meanwhile, looks up and sees the rest of the falling debris, his vision clear but hazy around the corners. He yells, Ah crap, 
Get off the ice! Blake immediately begins to dash for the tree line, while Ruby uncurls from Weiss and tries to run, only to falter on her bad leg with a yelp. Weiss rushes behind Ruby and loops an arm around her torso, dragging Ruby as quickly as she can towards the nearest patch of trees. Under the water of the lake, Yang and Neo are reorienting from the crash, only for a train carriage to smash down between them. The two flounder and take off away from the crashing debris. They get about two-thirds of the way before a long stretch of bridge crashes down onto the ice and into Neo, hooking her and dragging her deeper. Yang sees this and swims down to Neo, who is now pinned between the beam and the lake's floor. She tries to free Neo, but struggling makes her choke on her own breath, and she's forced to retreat to the surface. She bursts out of the lake, hanging on the edge of the ice like a swimming pool deck, coughing and sputtering for air. Blake, having gotten herself to safety, immediately rushes to Yang's side. She tries to help Yang out, but Yang panically declines Blake's hand, sputtering, Neo's trapped, and pointing into the water. Blake freezes until she hears Roman calling in panic for Neo as well. Blake snaps to awareness, ties her ribbon around her waist, throws the blade into a nearby tree, and jumps in, followed swiftly by Yang. The two men see this, and Crow takes a moment to register what the ribbon is for. As soon as he realizes what Yang and Blake are doing, he's rushing to grip it and yelling for Roman to help. Weiss and Ruby manage to hobble over, about to ask what's going on, when Crow hushes them. He stares at the ribbon, everything around them going quiet save for the parts of the train still crashing and sinking into the lake. After an uncomfortably long pause where we cut between the surface characters and the water, the line gets a tug. Crow and Roman immediately begin to pull, but the strain weighs on them. Crow yells for Ruby and Weiss to help. Ruby tries, but her leg buckles under her and Weiss has to step up to assist, even straining herself further by summoning a glyph to keep the three of them anchored. After an intense struggle, they manage to pull Blake, Yang, and an unconscious Neo free from the water. Still coughing up water herself, Blake jumps to start CPR on Neo, and after a few solid pumps to her diaphragm, Neo also coughs, retching out a small flood of liquid from her lungs. The small woman rolls over and painfully spits up the rest, and everyone's shoulders relax after all the physical and emotional exhaustion. Yang flies into Neo's side, hugging her tightly and flaring her aura just as Roman drops down and hugs her from the front. Weiss and Crow slump against the tree that Ruby is resting under. Blake watches Neo and Yang with some level of jealousy, but distracts herself by taking off her soaking coat. Awkwardly holding it in her arms, she comments, We'll need to find our luggage. All eyes turn to the cars that manage to land on solid ground, including the caboose. Ruby nods in agreement, takes a focusing breath, and turns to her uncle. Crow, you, Roman, and Blake start looking for anything that survived the crash. Weiss, make us a fire. Use dust if you have to. We need it now. Yang, Neo, both of you warm up. With that, she unbuckles her cloak and passes it over to Roman for him to cover the shivering duo. Uneasy stares are shared, and they're only made more uncomfortable when howling can be heard echoing in the distance. Ruby hardens her face and rests Crescent Rose across her hip, saying, Everyone stay alert. There's a moment of lag before everyone quietly breaks apart and spreads out to accomplish their assigned tasks. Ruby looks to Yang, who is huddling tight to Neo, trying to reassure her that everything will be fine. Neo shifts a little, but is still barely responsive. A special thanks goes out to all of my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel. If you like this content and want more of it, please consider supporting it. Also consider picking up my new action-adventure novel, The Artificer, which is now available for purchase on Amazon in digital and in print. With that all said, back to your regularly scheduled fixing. We crossfade to an open flame that Weiss has managed to start, with Ruby, Weiss, Yang, and Neo all trying to keep warm around it. Several bags are dropped into the snow by Blake and Roman, and Blake explains, We found what we could, but there's not much that survived. Even less of it that's dry. Crow walks up behind them, adding, Well, at least one thing survived the crash. And he wheels Bumblebee up to the crude campsite. He scowls, however, and looks to Yang. Sorry, kid, but it's come out worse for wear. It won't start. Yang frowns, but is too tired to complain, shivering closer to Neo. Wei speaks up, shaking her head in disbelief. It doesn't make any sense. Adam couldn't have attracted that many Grimm. Blake immediately counters that bitterly. You haven't met Adam. Only for Ruby to cut in stoically. No, Wei is right. It couldn't have been him. A single person couldn't do that. Wei agrees. Even when the Bramlins herded Grimm, it was a group effort. 
Blake, however, sticks to her guns and insists that Adam could, in fact, draw that many Grimm. But the conversation fades into the background as Roman is watching them. His eyes drift into the distance, as if distracted, and it slowly peels away into a look of confusion, then shocked revelation. They followed us, he mutters. Then he repeats more loudly to overpower the argument. They followed us. The conversation dies out and Ruby is quiet, putting a finger to her lips. After a moment of rumination, she catches on and says, After I cut the cars, the Grimms seemed to stay behind with us. They didn't follow the rest of the train. They got themselves buried in an avalanche instead of chasing after a whole train full of panicking civilians. Crow shrugs and challenges her observation. Grim aren't choosy. They're first come, first serve. And Roman retorts, Well, evidently not. Yang, teeth chittering, offers, Maybe it was just a fluke? Weiss shakes her head again. It can't be. The last time a pack of Grim acted like coordinated was... And Crow finishes, Beacon. He looks over to Roman. Hey, Oz, what do you make of all this? Roman blinks and pauses for a moment, waiting for Ozpin to arrive at the forefront, only for Ozpin to not manifest. Brows furrowing, Roman turns away to talk to himself, tapping his temple and saying, Hey, old man, you in there? He becomes more and more confused and looks into a nearby chunk of ice to see his reflection. He stares into it, as if it'll talk back to him with Ozpin's voice. Instead, there is silence. However, gradually, we hear the sound of Ozpin's whispers, inner thoughts that sound incomprehensible to us but are seemingly readable to Roman. Roman's eyes narrow further and he says, You know what drew them in, don't you? Ozpin is silent but Roman pushes. Is it me? Finally, Ozpin replies, No. Is it you? No. Grasping at straws and with a brief pause, Roman asks, Is it the relic? Ozpin's reply is slow to come. No. Roman realizes it is the relic and looks to where it's clipped to Ruby's belt. Ozpin realizes that Roman knows and quickly tries to obscure it by mentally saying, Its intentions are not to draw the Grim, but... Roman cuts him off. Intentions? That thing thinks? Is it alive? Ruby blinks in surprise and takes a moment to figure out what it is. She pulls the relic from her hip, looking at it in confusion and anxiety. Again, mentally, Ozpin says, You mustn't say a word more, prompting Roman to snarl. What are you hiding from us, Oz? Roman's posture changes with an almost audible snap as Ozpin takes over. He looks to Ruby and speaks in Ozpin's voice with a calm, clarifying tone. You need not worry about the relic. It is perfectly safe. Roman's face contorts as the real Roman reasserts control. He manages to shout, Oh, that's bullshit, and you know it! Another twist in his face, and Ozpin takes back over, Roman's body warring between the two men's distinct posture. Ozpin hisses, Your naivety is endangering everyone, everything! The rest of the party watch this exchange in confusion and horror as the two men fight for dominance of the body. Neo especially, in her half-awake daze, is horrified. Roman's body locks up and he begins to breathe heavily, mixing the audio of both men breathing. Eventually, Roman looks to Ruby, gritting his teeth and saying, Jin! She's called Jin! Red, call her now! In her terrified confusion, Ruby looks down at the relic, then to the struggling Roman, then to Neo's frightened eyes. She looks back to the relic and calls Jin's name. A fog drifts in from the trees, Thin at first, then thicker and thicker, the winds weaving random patterns in the air while kicking up the fallen snow. Then, in the consuming whiteout, a magnificent woman of blue and gold appears, floating above the barely visible ground. I am Jin, she announces, a warm smile on her lips. She continues, Sent by the gods to catalog the knowledge of existence and to bestow it upon the inheritors of man. I can answer questions of all there is and all there used to be. But temper your thirsts for knowledge, for I can only answer up to three questions, and once asked, each question takes a century to renew. This is my second summoning in as much time. As such, there are only two questions that remain. Please, tell me, what is your query? Everyone in the group is visibly awed at the sight, completely unable to speak. Ruby looks to Roman, who matches her gaze. As Ozpin. 
Ozpin pleads to Ruby. Please. Ruby. Don't. Crow steps beside Ozpin, looking to the group and saying, Hey. He doesn't get another word in as Blake and Weiss draw their weapons on him and Ozpin, faces confused and panicked. Crow raises his hands in defeat, looking to Ruby as he says, Do whatever you think is right, kiddo. Ruby silently looks to Jin, the cogs in her brain turning, and she asks, What is Ozpin hiding? Instantly, Ozpin rushes at her to physically stop her, and Ruby reactively twists to face him, drawing the damaged crescent rose and firing right at him. Ozpin vanishes into the void as the gunshot reverberates around the room. Ruby, now completely alone, looks around in a panic as Jin narrates, Once upon a time, there was a girl. Cut to black. End of episode.